Well, hi, and it, it's uh, it's really good of you to join me. Thank you. And uh, you, you're the base leader at um, Kiev, uh, which is a fantastic base, isn't it? I've, I've been there, but but years ago, um, a big training center right on the right on the river, huh? Yeah, it is. It's a it's a beautiful place. So we are started in 1993 with the vision for a Christian university when the communism just fell down. So that was a, something completely out of out of people's perspective and minds as a possibility. And uh, and right now, you know, we we are we are a training base, but at the same time, very heavy on evangelism and mercy ministry always have been. And it was something that God would always speak to us that never turn one uh, one priority over another one so always be that like that the SBS students would be running soccer together with them um, with the orphans and never forget why they are why they're learning bible and what it, what it's there for well uh it's it's a big base and you've trained a lot of people there and now it's quite different but you're not there are you and uh no. th th that's a that's a bit of a surprise i think to you and, and and to me so maybe you can explain that yeah yeah i was um actually in the so we've been leaders there for 12 years now and uh i remember in 12 years we had uh, now three times when we had to sit down and do plan a plan b plan c and uh, because, you know, 93, we got our independence, but then in 2004, we had our first revolution. And then in 2013, we had our second revolution. And this was the time I remember we sat down and said like, okay, plan A, because all the action was in Kiev. And, and uh, so we had to be very mindful as to, okay, we have foreigners, we have young people, we have students, we have preschool, we have school, like, what do we do with all of it? Like, what is our plan A, plan B? And at that time, we've decided to, we're going to participate very actively because the freedom of our organization was on the line. You know, we were talking about freedom for foreigners, freedom for foreign agencies, freedom for religion, freedom for education, all that yeah. stuff was on the line there. So I remember sitting and saying, okay, plan A, and they only stay downtown Kiev. We can just go there, participate the protests and come back. Plan B, if the shooting will start, we'll bring the wounded to our base and, and, and tend to them. And we did get to plan B. And plan C was like, if military comes in, this is the bag you, you grab and you run. So we didn't get to plan C. So then in 2014, when uh, annexation of Crimea happened, when troops came into the east, we again said, okay, and play A, plan B, plan C. <laughs> and uh, we didn't get to any of those plans because it kind of remained all in the east and in the south. So then when COVID hit, we the same thing. We we're like, okay, plan A, plan B, plan C, what do we do? And so then in December, Last year, we sat down and we're like, okay, we hear all these threats about the, the war and they are escalating. And at that point, we had five visiting teams at our base in December that were freaking out, asking us a lot of questions. And so I remember sitting in plan A, plan B, plan C. And, and uh, one of the things was like, okay, if uh, uh, plan C was if war will start in Kiev, it, if it will get to Kiev, like, and in our minds, it was, uh, you know, moving from the east towards Kiev. Right. Right. And um, so then we, we asked our, all of our staff, we have 50 staff right now, we asked each one of them to submit us those plans. Okay, plan A, plan B, plan C, what will you do? And um, so we were sitting down, I remember even laughing, sitting like, we can't believe that it's third time with the same leadership yeah. team that we have to come up with those ABC plans. And uh, as we were sitting down in a circle, um, we did realize that three of our leadership team members will decide to remain in the city, even if the troops will come in to yeah. Kiev. And, and then uh, uh, many of us, especially the ones with kids, we have agreed that we will not be in the country or at least not in the Kiev, somewhere in the west of Ukraine. So then when January hit, no, actually it was already February because we had a leadership training um, uh, LT uh, meeting planning in Chernigiv, which right now is a completely destroyed city. So we spent a wonderful week there planning for a year praying through everything. 
and um, and uh, so uh, so it was it was February. We decided that let's take a three weeks off all ministries. We could afford the only ministry that was going on was preschool and and a school. We have a school up to eighth grade, so those were the only ministries that we could not stop. But the rest, we said let's stop. Everybody like the parents were emailing us the. Um, you know, the, the donors, the, the sponsors were emailing us, all the teams by then were gone because, uh, you know, foreigners and, and that. So we just said how everybody just either go west to the western base in Ukraine, Ternopil, or, or go and see your family, spend some time, come everybody down. Uh, March 20th was a quarter that was supposed to start for schools. We, uh, I was supposed to lead the School of Worldview, and we were also supposed to start the School of Biblical Studies. So we're like, okay, beginning of March, everybody come back. If nothing was, will start by then, it's just going to continue to be these threats, and we know how to live on this threats. That was not the news for us. So, um, so I took two of my kids and we came to United States. My husband is American. So two of how kids, many? Uh, of three. Okay. Now, uh, so this is, this is our family. You know, we were always fighters. We've never escaped anything. All our kids were participating in all our ministries. And so we had a uh, quite a bit of conflicts over leaving or staying. So our oldest daughter, which is almost 18, she said, no way am I leaving. I am staying. I'm gonna be here. All of this is just threats. You know, we need to be here. So I took the two younger ones, 15 and 10 year olds, and we came to United States. And Kyle, my husband, stayed in Kiev for um, with our oldest. And so then, how, so how did how did you feel when 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 the actual hostilities broke out? It must have been awful, huh? Uh, it was it was pretty it was horrible from a shock. Yeah. I think that was the worst, is the shock that it actually happening in Kiev. Right. We did not expect it. No. We did not. And, and we actually found out from the news before our people found out, because we yeah. I remember um, because it was still an evening here. I remember hearing uh, Putin's speech about starting military operations in, in the Ukraine. And I remember calling our, our guy. He was staying in our house watching our dog. Yeah. And I remember calling him and saying like, hey, uh, Putin just declared war against Ukraine. And he's like, no way, everything is okay here. And we're like, well, and he said he hung up and a minute later explosions because our house is close to the airport. And he's like, the house was rambling. And he's like, I thought that was it. I thought I will not, uh, I will die here along with your dog because nobody was, uh, you know, was still, it was 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. And um, so he said it was the closest fear for him. But then as he, you know, got out and drove to the base and, and um, so then, as I told you, everybody submitted plans to us about what that they could do. That was so wise, huh? To, oh, and, and I mean, we did some mind. other precautions. We we stock up on food. We stock up yeah. on fuel. Our base is really self-sufficient with water generators. Natural, even if natural gas goes out, we have wooden stoves. So we were we were thinking, I'm like, if anything happens. The only thing we do not have is bomb shelter. That was the only thing that we right. realized that it was really life-threatening. And we did encourage everybody actually to leave the base. We said that because of the bomb shelter, you won't be able to do, to help a whole lot and you won't be able to even be safe yourselves. But anyways, as we sub as the plans were submitted, we knew that seven of us will stay. Seven of our people in on the staff right. were, were deciding to stay back two months before everything started. So we uh, contact all our staff. Like that was the first thing we did. We start calling. What are you doing? Where are you? How are you? And as we were calling, we knew that the seven are still remaining and they, they prayed again. And they said, we feel like God is saying that we must stay and we want to stay. We understand all the, all the risks. We understand all the threats, but we we stay. So then me and Kyle, we told them, okay, if you're staying, then from our side, we will do everything to make sure that you're provided for. So yeah. the supply yeah. lines, the finances, the, the cars. So from the second day hitting, we, we bought new vehicles, we wow. sent 
trucks in. We we uh, built a whole network around Europe, which uh, I am absolutely amazed by amazing, my WEM family and how fast it is. Amazing how fast you know being um, building relationships over the years. I was able to call so many people within one day. Yeah. One day we bought four vehicles in one day, and they were how, on the way that, to Kiev. How did that happen? And you know, you know, I read that, and I thought, yeah. really, where did they get the money that fast? How did that happen? You know, actually, the, uh, yeah, but this is this is the 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 mm -hmm. good thing was of us being here. As much as I, I felt so guilty for not being in in Kiev. I've never left through any of the protests and revolutions we had. Actually, was very active. Yeah. Uh, participate, participant of all of all of it because I'm Ukrainian. I I I love my country and I love the the path we are on to freedom and and I believe to God's kingdom, not just you know democracy. Mm -hmm. I believe God's God's values are being established over the past thirty years, and I'm not oblivious to our problems. Please understand me right. That is why I'm on the streets. I'm not oblivious to our problems, but um, so the initial emotion overwhelming emotion was guilt i remember calling our our former base leader crying on the phone saying i why am i not there how can i lead my team how can i prefer my safety to the calling that god gives me you know you have all these thoughts overwhelming absolutely overwhelming yeah. am i not yeah. sacrificial am i too scared for my life like but then we did realize of what a value we were here because the yeah. community here in the United States picked up a need immediately, like immediately yeah. pouring money in. And we, we did have some, uh, some capital money saved. I'm not saying that we were completely on the zero. No, we started with some. So we right away uh, put money on each person that was that remained there all seven people we right away transferred money to them making sure that that they have and we did have cash stacked there as well so we said this is where you go this is where it is this is where everything is you know hooking up with a satellite phone uh, four vehicles we bought, not even from a YWAM family, actually. It was people I have never met before, mm. uh, Czech Republic, Bethel Church. And um, through some connections, actually, I was helping to helping one of the friends to find a place to live as they were escaping the country. And they wanted to go to Czech Republic. So I started to calling, 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 and, and finally got a hold of this uh, uh, community that we still are very closely working together. Right. These uh, I, about 15 brothers from Czech Republic, fearful, fearless, you know, with bringing fuel to us, bringing uh, food, especially first couple of weeks when everybody was too scared for to go to Kiev. And actually none of them drove all the way to Kiev, but they would bring stuff to Ternopil. And then our guys would come and pick them up from Ternopil. So, that was our job. Our job was still remains to be the public speakers, to raise finances, yeah. to uh, and the supply lines to make sure we find everything from everybody and and that gets to Kiev. You know, we found here um, there's a, a a friend of a friend phoned and put me in touch with a couple who were wanting help. They own and operate a, a small airline. It, I was told it's actually I think it's a charter company, but they. They, they have large business jets that they, you know, up to 30 passengers or even more. And, and they, they were just wanting to, to take food and, and uh, whatever supplies were needed out as quickly as possible. So we helped them load a plane up and get the manifesto done. And they, they landed, they, they couldn't go on into Ukrainian airspace, but they landed in Romania and the goods went in. Everybody wants to help. Yes. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is absolutely true. I get phone calls. Now we are working to the extent of two trucks a week, two food trucks a week going to Kiev. Right. And and uh, and before, like when it's just happened, uh, we were feeding up to a thousand hot meals per day oh, wow. of just of giving of giving people because hot meals, people were in subways, people were, yeah. Yeah. you know, they had no access to kitchens or anything like that. Then slowly by slowly, and, and we had six vehicles that were evacuating every day, evacuating from the from Kiev, from outskirts. Then we we moved to Chernigiv, then we moved to Bucha. Then now now we are more on to the east with our with our um, 
evacuating crew. But uh, Lynn, it's it's boys, 19, 20 yeah. year olds, 21 is uh, is the oldest that is driver that is going into places. And and but we did make a rule. We we ask that everybody who is a parent is not there. We said like, would you right. please? Uh, unless uh, there is some, so we don't have any parents among our team in, in Kiev. Uh, oh yeah, and, and we did connect then with uh, David Cunningham and he yeah. connected us with a very um, professional as, as, um, expert. I'm not gonna say his name, but he came in to train our guys on how to evacuate. He's had a great experience of extractions from of people well, from good. Afghanistan. And, and so he's been training our guys on safety. And because, um, yes. you know, as yes. Sasha said, he's like, your guys are adrenaline junkies. I'm like, that's the only way to live for them right <laughs> that's now. Right. That's right. That's on great, adrenaline. Great uh, what, what is the, what is the most threatening um, thing that's happened and, and what time did that happen did, you know because we know they were trying to it seems they were trying to actually take Kiev and they yeah. and they were not able to and they so they did some missiles they did some artillery uh did anything land on your base anything near or how, how have you been no uh actually uh, it's first month 30 days you would not uh you would always be in a constant tension because for 30 days they kept on trying and trying and trying to to get to take over Kiev and and uh, uh, just for those that have never been in Ukraine uh, everything is gated here everything is fenced in we don't have open property so our base is actually surrounded by cement walls and and, and a locked gate so and uh, so that kind of does give us a little bit of um, safety feeling, yeah. but uh, with the mis missiles, of course, and the air raids, and uh, those were, um, you know, every night you you just prayed. The for me it was you know through the day, half day at about you know four o'clock, uh, sometimes three o'clock. I'm on my knees, and and I understand yeah. this is the nighttime for Kiev and uh, my parents are still in Ukraine. They live uh, not too far from Kiev. So I was on my knees every day saying, please yeah. Lord, like safe and, and, and save us and save Kiev. And, and because I knew that was a tipping point for, for a war itself, right? And, and they understood that as well, that taking over Kiev would be a, a victory. Yeah, yeah. So it uh, the th definitely every night was threatening, and then even during the day was threatening. They did come in um, uh, Brovary, which is about um, I would say um, how many miles? Uh, I mean kilometers. We're thinking it's say, about half yeah. half an hour ride away from okay. from the base, and and some missiles did hit our uh, our locations like uh, near to us, but not not our base. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, what what do you expect now? There's a lull in the fighting as we record this. Maybe yeah. as people are listening to this, uh, it will be farther down the road. But it looks like they are repositioning their troops to try to take the south. And some commentators are saying they they expect then to close it on Kiev again, but from the yeah. south. What what do you expect? Uh, Lynn, from very beginning, the word that the Lord gave me, it was from Ephesians chapter six, when the evil comes, know how to stand, and then going through it, keep on standing. So for me right now, we are in keep on standing against evil, right. although it might look for Kiev right now, like it's a bit of a break and we, we need it. We, we for sure, I yeah. mean, everybody needs it. You know, we all pray that it, it would be over, but this is the time of keep on standing against evil um because because it's still attacking and yeah. um i do realize there are several there's scheming going on right the enemy is scheming he's scheming yeah. be behind he's thinking yeah. he's strategizing yeah. and and it's both spiritually speaking and physically speaking you know they're, they're trying they're trying to strategize they're trying to do the land path right now mariupol is like kiev for me in my prayers mariupol is kiev you got i'm just keep on praying that they do not overtake it because it also it would be a tipping point it would yeah. be a tipping yeah. for the war so uh that that is in my prayers as as a battle um uh practically speaking i i, I want more 
sorry, I want more weapon for Ukraine. That's yeah. practically speaking. Yeah. This is uh, my personal prayer is I do believe that God puts army in order to do justice on earth and, and to do uh, order and protection and safety. So I pray a blessing for our, for our army, for our military guys, that they would be so supernaturally equipped and protected. And um, so for me, uh, speculating from here, of course, right now, the efforts will be on the East and, and our efforts is on the East as well with humanitarian aid and with evacuation efforts yeah. too. But uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we, as, yeah, it's just, it's just heartbreaking to see what has happened yeah. around Kiev. And I'm sure you've seen the news, you've seen the images to, on the, to realize that it is happening as we speak right now in the East is heartbreaking to yeah. to yeah. realize that this is what it looks like it has no rules it's not a war of uh, of dignity of any kind it's not yeah. a war yeah. over power uh, it it does not have values it does not have rules of war of course you know all these uh, crime war crimes that are already recorded and and to realize that it's happening to the people in the East right now is, is pretty bad. To see how the, the city after city, town after town being destroyed is like, why? It should not be happening at all. So my yeah. expectation is to stand in Mariupol, stand strong and, and, and to have the victories in the East. As we've been reading the reports, uh, and we're really grateful for Al Akimov and others, and I know you're helping to provide those reports too, uh, we hear a, a lot of stories of people being very receptive to prayer and, and really wanting uh, to have a, a stronger faith. And I, I think in, in times of suffering, people go one of two ways. They either become really angry at God, blaming him for what human beings are doing, and, and, or, the, or they become soft in, in heart. Do you have a feel for, for how the people are, are responding to this? I honestly feel that people are responding soft. And, yeah. and we've always been, Ukraine was always a um, God-fearing nation. You know, we are Orthodox, of course, in our majority, but then Catholic in, in, in quite a bit as well. So there's always been a... Uh, um, there's always been a fear of God in a good sense, an honor to him. But um, I do feel that we are on the softer side. Of course, there are people that... Uh, but I think it's our hope. You know, this is where our hope lies. Because if you didn't, if you become angry with God, then you have nowhere to put your hope in. Absolutely. Then, then you should you should just finish. And so that's why I think I do believe that Ukraine is on the soft side because of that's the only hope we have. Uh, and and seeing the world leaders' responses, we are grateful for some, but then for some we do realize that they could have done more. And, and yet nothing is happening. We are on our own yeah. with yeah. God. So yeah. that's why I think the softness, what helps is where, what else do you have? You have no, you have no one else but God to help you and, and to stand with you through this time. You know, after, after the uh, Soviet Union crumbled and Ukraine became recognized again as, as a separate nation, um, and by the way, I, I was there before that happened, and we could see the hunger. Actually, the years of atheism had created an incredible hunger in people because their spirits were dry. And uh, we met people who were just wanted to know more. Uh, and, then, and then when it crumbled and, and there was freedom of, of different sorts, um, churches began to grow at, at a dramatic rate. And many, many, many people declared themselves to be Christians. And I read recently 71% of Ukrainians self-identify as Christians. Um, and we I think many people have heard of the large churches. And in some ways, um, it may be that the Ukraine is, is the most uh, Christianized of, uh, of quite an atheistic continent with, mm -hmm. uh, with Europe. Uh, would you comment on that? Yeah, I was a part of a church that was 20,000 people wow. in, early, in early 2000. It was uh, led by a Nigerian pastor, good intentions. The church is not, not there anymore. And then he did not end up very well in it character wise, but, um, but I did, I was one of the hungry. I got saved uh, in the, in the late nineties. Uh, uh, I did not 
grow up Christian at all, you know, not a Christian background or family, but that's, that's when I gave my life to Jesus, knowing the choice I'm making. And, and I've seen lots and lots of Christians around me. And I think, you know, we have never were an arrogant nation as Ukraine. We, we always realized our weaknesses and our dependence on God. And I think that's what, what kept the hunger is that we re inside, we knew we are not self-sufficient. We never felt like we, that, I think that's a big difference between if you take the three nations with the Belarus and Russia and, and Ukraine is, um, you know, Russia always had that domineering, yeah. um, I don't want, you know, I, and I want to be careful, but the domineering arrogance and, and pride that we are mighty. Oh. And, yeah, the, and, the history just shows that that's not arrogant. Yeah. <laughs> and I honestly think the only way the propaganda lives there, it's because it is rooted in in that domineering arrogance and and the might and self might that they have within them. Because if you look at Belarus, they have Lukashenko was there as long as Putin, and and is very similar in in uh, uh, in regimes and uh, in the way of uh, doing the government. But yet uh, the Belarus people. Do not believe the propaganda. They are controlled right. out because of fear, but they don't believe the propaganda. You oh, ask them, and ninety percent say we do not fight, want to fight Ukraine. Yet Russia, you ask, and I'm not going to say ninety percent of Russians, but a majority say we want to fight Ukraine. They should right. be ours. And I do believe that the only way the propaganda lives there is because it is rooted and founded into, yeah, you know, we are mighty and we can and we oh, should yeah. and and why not and how can they not and so it's rooted in that in that dominance and in that. Um, uh, desire. So Ukraine, I think the hunger and the and the growth of church and response to God was that we never were self-sufficient. We always knew that we needed uh, we needed God, that we are not God. Well, that is a very significant observation. Um, I understand that also there were there were a lot of Ukrainians going into other Slavic nations uh, as missionaries uh, prior to this. And now, it's a bit like Acts 8, isn't it? Um, the believers are being scattered everywhere, and, and we need to pray that they preach the gospel wherever they go, like they did in, in Acts 8, and that, and that new uh, believers and new churches spring up. Do you have any news on that? Do you have any idea of what's happening with the many, many people who have been displaced? I'll tell you, you know, over the years, we always had these people that would come in and say, a revival will come through Ukraine. And I always thought like, yeah, I mean, of course, it's nice to say when you're a visiting person, a guest to a nation that's, but now, uh, unfortunately, the revival is coming in a different way through Ukraine than, than I would wish it was coming. Yeah. And but but it's definitely re reviving Europe. It's it's reviving uh, United States even to yeah. a point of like, what do you believe? What do you stand for? As far as Christians scattered, uh, Christians that I know, pastors and churches that contacted me personally are definitely on a mission. They are not there to to sit still and not do anything and to mope. You know, they yeah. are there to to yeah. to preach the gospel. Of course, majority wants to come back. They, they we are we are hoping that very soon we can go back to our nation and, and continue sure. what we are doing. But uh, even with that, um, yeah, we are on a mission for sure. Well, we're just about out of time, but let me return back to you and your situation. You've got a family that's separated from one another. Uh, can you make any plans? Do you have any plans or are you waiting to see? Well, actually, Kyle did come. He's here with, okay. with Bianca, our oldest one. We are together. We are going back the end of May. Uh, our oldest daughter is graduating, and, and she's determined to graduate together with her class, although they are all over the place. None of them stayed in Kiev in Ukraine. So they will meet up in Budapest, but then we are planning to hopefully go back. We're planning to to uh, make our way to Kiev, see my parents, see our base, and, and then we'll decide from there as to what would it look like for our children, of course. Great, great. Well, just before we started this conversation, Anya, uh, I got word that some that we had a, a, quite a lot of trouble with our online bank uh, making mistakes with us. <laughs> 
And but we finally got word that they've they've released the money that we we've seen come in. We've seen quite a lot of money come in uh, to buy more vans to get more people out because at, at this point, uh, evacuation is is the great need, isn't it? And of course, food and and the other necessary items at the borders is also very important. So we've got a team now in Poland uh, on the border, and we've got another exploratory team going in on Monday to Moldova, uh, and we've been helping out in Romania. But we're just one of the many, many, many YWAM centers. And I think again and again, uh, where there's a YWAM center, then everybody around them uh, wants to help. So um, we keep praying for, for uh, an anointed logistics operation <laughs> so that everything gets yeah, where it should yeah. be. And, that's, and you know, Lynn, I heard this phrase, they said like, we are as like little ants, you know, each brings a bit, but then we yeah. make a huge hill. And this is what we are seeing, a huge hill of, of many, many ants around that are doing their job and not being indifferent and, and uh, continuing to hold us in prayer. Although it's, it's a 50 day today, today is the mark of 50 days. Yeah. And, and so in, in the, it's for 50 days, I, I still have people that are saying, we're here, we're praying, we're not leaving. Because yeah. I do, I do, very last thing I'm going to say, I do believe that right now as Christian body, we need to respond in two ways. One is a prayer, of course, you know, yeah. we pray, pray, pray. Yeah. And another one is a hand of relief to the suffering. Right. We have right. to do whatever we can to, to relieve the suffering that is happening right now. All right. Well, God bless you and your work, and we'll carry on with our work, and we'll be those little ants that each do our bit, <laughs> and uh, we'll talk again, okay? If you, yeah. and when you have time, I, I'd love to just get up to date with you again in a, in a week or two, okay? Yeah. Thank you. It's been excellent. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye then.